This is BBC Two's Learning Zone. Now, heavenly bodies. In the final programme of the series, we find out how local time helps to explain the astronomical basis of longitude. I had to endure such fatigues from the severity of the weather and the duty which the charge of the ship brought upon me that really life is not worth preserving. Whoever would have thought that telling the time could be a matter of life and death? May 1741, and the HMS Centurion somewhere off the coast of Chile was in a desperate situation. The ship had taken a terrible battering rounding Cape Horn, and many of the crew were either dead or dying of the dreaded scurvy. Where the other five ships and the squadron were, no one knew. The only hope was to reach land, repair the ship, and put the crew ashore to recover. But the orders were explicit, to stay out of sight of the mainland to avoid alerting the Spanish with whom Britain was at war. So they decided to head for the tiny island of Juan Fernandez, 400 miles off the coast of Chile. Juan Fernandez was the original desert island. Some years earlier, a marooned sailor had survived for five years on the island, and his story became the basis of that most famous of books. Juan Fernandez would also be the saving of the centurion, if only they could manage to find it. But in 1741, finding a tiny island was often like looking for a needle in a haystack. To know where an island is, you need two things, its latitude and its longitude. A latitude is a line that goes around the Earth. A longitude is a line that goes from north to south. If you know both, then where they cross is the position of the island. Now, the centurion knew where the island was. They didn't know where they were. They had a way of working out their latitude, but as for longitude, well, they were all at sea. Centurion sailed north until they knew the latitude was right. They were somewhere on this line. But they couldn't see the island, and so they didn't know whether they were east or west of it. They now faced a terrible problem. If they were west of the island, they needed to sail east, otherwise they would head out into the Pacific. But if they were on the other side of the island, they needed to sail west, otherwise they would hit the mainland and warn the Spanish of their arrival. Their first guess, to sail along the latitude going west, was actually right. But then, when they were in fact very close to the island, they reckoned they'd been wrong, turned around and sailed east. When they saw the mainland ahead, they realized their mistake and turned around again. Because of their mistake, they had to sail an extra thousand miles. Another hundred men died, and they reached the island with hardly enough crew to sail the ship. This story is about how the sun can be used to find out where you are, why latitude was so easy to work out, 
but why finding longitude was so hard? And how, after the most enormous efforts, the longitude problem finally came to be solved. But this story is also about astronomy. Every navigator who fixed their ship's position was, in a sense, an astronomer. That's because, out of sight of land, they knew their position from the sun and the stars. This clever contraption is a combination of sundial and alarm clock. As the sun moves across the sky, the arm of the sundial, the gnomon, casts a shadow across the face of the dial. At the same time, the lens focuses the sun's rays to a point. When the sun is at its highest, it's noon, and the shadow is at its shortest. It's also the moment when the focused rays of light reach the touch hole of the cannon. And all the principles of solar navigation are encapsulated here, at this one moment. The Earth turns on its axis once a day, so the sun always seems to be moving across the sky. If we put a little stick here on the UK, we can see the shadow moving as the Earth turns. At this point, when we're nearest to the sun, the shadow is at its shortest and the sun is at its highest. It's local noon. And every place on a line, north or south of us, is also at local noon. But if our stick is here at the moment of local noon, the sun appears to be higher in the sky and the shadow is shorter. North of the UK, the sun will appear to be lower in the sky and the shadow correspondingly longer. We can use this to determine how far north or south we've travelled, in other words, our latitude. We could do it by measuring the length of the shadow at noon, but when you're at sea, it's easier to measure the height of the sun at noon. This technique of navigation had been known for centuries. You waited until the sun was at its highest at local noon. You then compared that height with the height the sun would have been on that day in your home port. If the sun was higher, you were south of home. If the sun was lower, then you had to be north. A few years ago, a replica of Drake's ship, Golden Hind, sailed across the Atlantic from London to Barbados using just this technique of navigation. Chris Daniel explains how they did it, now without his beard. This is a cross staff, which consists of a wooden graduated staff uh, with a cross piece or vein, which you hold up to your, you hold the staff up to your eye and you slide the vein in to increase the angle or move it out to decrease the angle. And the object of the exercise is to line up the bottom edge of the vein with the horizon and the top edge of the vein with the centre of the sun. And when you've got it just right, you then read off the angle on this scale. And from this, you can deduce the latitude. Well, I took a snap observation a few minutes ago with a very hazy sun and, and with uh, pretty nasty weather conditions. And I determined the latitude, which puts us about 118 miles south in the English <laughs> Channel instead of in the Bristol Channel. <laughs> well, that was really due to the, the rough weather and the wind, and it was only a snap observation. Normally, you would wait for some time and take a, a steady observation until the sun reached its maximum height, and then you'd read off the moment of noon. And that's how it was done. So, Chris, we've taken our reading from the sun, we know our latitude, now, how do we navigate? Well, in those days, it was very much a matter of by guess and by God. Supposing we were out somewhere in the Atlantic and we were coming into Bristol, what we would do is head north or south until we came to the latitude of the Seven Estuary, which in this case is 51 degrees and 20 minutes north, and we would then turn eastwards and sail in along that parallel of latitude, making what is called uh, the easting, until such time as we sighted the land and were in bearings, and then you could run into your home port. When the Golden Hind was sailing for Barbados, 
uh, we ran in from the east towards Barbados until we sighted the island using the cross staff to obtain latitude. And funny enough, when we arrived in Barbados, there was the QE2, and the crew were invited aboard uh, for a meal and uh, so on. Nice. And they offered us showers first. And <laughs> then we went up to the bridge and had a look at their navigation equipment. And they've got a lot of uh, marvelous satellite equipment. And then, of course, they asked us how we navigated. So I told them we used a piece of wood and another bit of wood, and we slid it up and down. That's, that's how we got our position. And funnily enough, a fortnight later, QE2 ran on a reef. <laughs> <laughs> so, steering east or west is relatively easy. You just make sure that the sun's height at local noon remains the same. If it gets higher, you've started veering south. And if it gets lower, you're too far north of your chosen latitude. However, you won't know exactly where you are, except that you are somewhere on this line. But along a line of latitude, it can only be local noon at one point. We are aware that when we're having lunch in the UK, the sun has only just risen in America. It takes five hours from the moment the sun tells us it's noon here to the moment when it is noon in New York. But this phenomenon works on a smaller scale as well. There's a neat demonstration of how longitude works, not at sea, but between villages and towns of southern England, if we go back 150 years. At a church on the east coast, it's local noon. The sun is at its highest. The shadow on the sundial is at its shortest. It takes a little while before local noon reaches this church, which lies further west. Gradually, local noon moves further and further west. And half an hour after it was noon on the east coast, this church in Cornwall is striking noon. In other words, there's half an hour time difference across the country. Amazingly, for hundreds of years, towns across Britain all had their own local time, until suddenly it started to be a problem for the post office. mail coaches started running just before 1800. Other people on the road had to watch out when they heard that call. It means clear the road. And if you didn't and caused the mail coach to stop or even slow down, then the penalties could be very tough. You could be fined, imprisoned, or even deported. interconnecting network of coaches across the country, there had to be a very strict time. So the guard carried a leather pouch which included his guard's watch. One story says there was a penny fine for every minute the coach was late. London to Bristol took 16 hours, and the timetable laid down exactly how long each stage of the journey was supposed to take, right down to the last minute. Four hours, 12 minutes were allowed from Colnbrook to here at Thatcham. Then exactly 20 minutes for a pint or two, and to pick up the mail, of course. And from here until the next stop at Marlborough, they allowed exactly two hours, 30 minutes. 
Now for the first time, the fact that the towns along the way all had their own local time actually mattered. Because a clock sector London time was actually five minutes ahead of local time here in Thatcham. And it's 11 minutes past by the time you got to Bristol. All aboard the London Bristol coach. So running such an exact timetable had given them a problem, matching London time with local time. The first solution was to leave local time where it was and to adjust the watch. And so the guard's watch was set to run slow when going west. In fact, it lost 15 minutes every 24 hours, which means at this steady speed, the guard's watch was always telling local time, or as people thought of it, real time. And when traveling back east, watch was set to gain 15 minutes a day. For the Royal Mail, it wasn't too difficult to work to local time, and most people, since they didn't travel much, could ignore these little variations. Who cared if the clocks in a distant town were five minutes different? But within 50 years, a new arrival had swept aside the mail coaches, and also began to sweep aside the whole idea of local time. In 1841, the fledgling Great Western Railway started running the first through trains between London and Bristol. You can't run a railway with all the stations working to local time, so Great Western issued an order. On all its trains and in all its stations, London time would be kept. Now the guard's watch didn't run fast or slow anymore. It kept to London time, railway time as it was often known. And so the train steamed west, they carried okay, London time. With them. Now this doesn't matter as far as the railway was concerned, but what about the poor old passenger? If you arrived at Bristol Station hoping to catch the 8 o'clock train to London, you had to remember that it left at 8 o'clock London time, which was 11 minutes to 8 Bristol time. Small wonder people sometimes miss their trains. In order to help, they put up this clock in the middle of Bristol with two minute hands. One shows London time, the other, red one, is set 11 minutes earlier to Bristol time. It couldn't last. Gradually the railways and then the electric telegraph took over and in 1880, after 40 years of glorious confusion, London time became the official time throughout the country. It's certainly more convenient nowadays, but it's still true that local time, as measured by the sun, varies across the country, even though we now choose to ignore the fact. But for 40 years, while the two time systems were in operation, there was a clever little trick that a few people must have noticed and it's crucial for navigation. The local clock tells me it's three o'clock. My own watch, which is London time, says seven minutes past three. So not as far as Bristol, where the difference would be 11 minutes, we're about two-thirds of the way approximately 77 miles. This whole idea of distance and time underpins one of the fundamental principles of navigation, that of longitude. If I take my watch with me on a ship, it will tell me London time. If 
I then use the sun to determine local time by working out local noon. The difference between the two should tell me how far east or west of London I've travelled. That's all very well in theory, and it's easy to measure local time, since a cross staff or sextant will measure when the sun is at its highest, which is local noon. The problem is knowing London time. You need an accurate clock on board. Now, there were good clocks in the 18th century, but they all had pendulums, and were as much used at sea as, well, There were watches, of course, with a spring rather than a pendulum, so you could carry them around in your pocket, but they weren't much good, and to work out your longitude, your clock has to be surprisingly accurate. In 24 hours, the Earth turns once on its axis, that's 360 degrees, so it turns through a single one of those degrees in just four minutes. So, if we know London time to an accuracy of four minutes, we can work out where we are to within one degree of longitude, and that will get you roughly where you want to go. But if our journey lasts for six weeks, then the accuracy of the timekeeper still has to be within four minutes at the end of that time, which means it has to be accurate to within six seconds. A clock that good was unimaginable, and the goal of finding a way of working out your longitude seemed very far away. Something pretty dramatic was needed. Making an accurate clock was literally a matter of life and death, and money. In 1714, the British government decided to offer a prize of £20,000, worth today's money, if anyone could find a way of solving the longitude problem. A board of longitude were besieged by obsessed inventors with crazy and practical ideas, but even the enormous reward didn't bring an immediate solution. But 16 years after the reward was offered, a man arrived in London who claimed he could solve the problem. John Harrison was a self-taught clockmaker from Lincolnshire, and with his broad Lincolnshire accent, he appeared as something of a country bumpkin to the gentleman on board. He claimed what many people thought impossible. He would build a clock that would keep accurate time at sea. He even persuaded the Board of Longitude to give him a loan while he set about building it. It took him five years, and when it was finished, the Admiralty arranged for Harrison to travel to Lisbon to test the clock at sea. By coincidence, the ship they chose was our old friend, the Centurion, but this was several years before her South American trip. Harrison had a miserable voyage. He was seasick all the way. His one consolation was that the clock really performed rather well but not well enough to win the prize. And so Harrison brought H1, as it came to be known, back to his workshop. It would have been a godsend to the Centurion five years later when they were searching for the island of Juan Fernandez. What a shame Harrison hadn't left his clock on board. It would probably have helped quite a bit, even though it wasn't that accurate. Harrison spent another five years on his next clock, then decided he didn't like it. He spent 19 years on the next version, but he didn't like that one either. The Board of Longitude must have despaired. Time was running out for Harrison. His fourth effort was tiny, a watch you could hold in the palm of your hand. This was the watch, Harrison claimed, that would keep virtually the perfect time, even at sea. People doubted that it would work. It was just a watch, after all. But Harrison persevered, and a trial was set up. The government wanted to make sure the watch was reproducible. It was no good if Harrison, who was by this time an old man was the only person who could build the watch. So they asked another clockmaker, Larkham Kendall, to make a copy. And it was this copy that was given the ultimate test. It was 
was sent on a voyage around the world lasting three years on HMS Resolution under the command of Captain Cook. Temperature changes are bad news for clocks, and this voyage was to take them through the heat of the tropics and the cold of the Arctic and the Antarctic. At the beginning of the voyage, Cook had not been especially impressed with the newfangled gadget. But he found that the watch was so accurate, he could work out his position to within two miles or so. Towards the end of the voyage, Cook wrote to the Secretary of the Admiralty. The watch has exceeded the expectations of its most zealous advocate and has been our faithful guide through all the vicissitudes of climate. On his way home, Cook, having rounded the Cape of Good Hope, decided to make for the tiny island of St Helena. But now, rather than the old-fashioned way of running down the latitude as the centurion had done 30 years earlier, in his chronometer that he decided to set the course. St. Helena is a tiny island in the middle of the South Atlantic. Normally it would have been just as difficult to find as Juan Fernandez had been just 30 years previously. But now Cook had the benefit of the watch, so he knew exactly where he was and therefore exactly which direction to steer. On this final part of his voyage, Cook was accompanied by a merchant ship, the Dutton. The captain of the Dutton was afraid that they would miss the island. But Cook just laughed and told him that he could run their jibs smack into St. Helena if he wanted. It was only a small joke by a man returning home in a relaxed mood after a successful voyage. But that small joke was probably as great a compliment as John Harrison could ever have wished for. did not deceive us, and we made it accordingly on the 15th of May at daybreak, in the direction of west-northwest, about 14 leagues distant. It was a revolution in navigation. Now, so long as they could see the sun, sailors could find their position to within a couple of miles. Joseph Gilbert, who sailed with Cook, described the watch as the greatest piece of mechanism the world has yet produced. And while the clock had been constructed by Lark and Kendall, the design was, of course, Harrison's, and so ultimately was the glory. It took some arguing, even an appeal to the king, but John Harrison finally got the prize. By now he was over 80 years old and had dedicated his whole life to making four chronometers. They were all amazing in their own way, but his final triumph was H4, which enabled ships for the first time to find their way safely. If you could have a national monument that would fit in the palm of your hand, made not of stone, but of brass and steel, then perhaps this would be it. We put together an astronomy project which will help to get you started. If you'd like to find out more about the night sky, if you'd like a pack, please send a check or postal order for nine pounds ninety-nine, made out to BBC Education, to this address: Astronomy Pack, P.O. Box Seven, London, W3, 6XJ.
a new horizon.